Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The Biden administration has just increased the limit for foreigners seeking refuge in the United States. And Democrats are now calling the situation on the southern border a crisis. Biden visited an elementary school and a community college in Virginia today to sell his latest spending plan. No Republicans support the plan and even some Democrats are questioning the government expansion. The Biden administration may be considering partnering with private companies to monitor extreme online activity. We speak to a cybersecurity expert on what this could mean. India still reports over 300,000 COVID cases a day. Another state says it will issue a lockdown, but cases there aren't so high. An expert tells us why. Biden kicked off this week by trying to build momentum for his new nearly $2 trillion social welfare spending plan. The president and first lady went to an elementary school and a community college in Virginia today, setting the stage to justify using a hefty wealth tax to fund universal pre-K, two years of free community college and other social service programs. Biden says he doesn't want to punish anyone, but says everyone should chip in. And by everyone, he's alluding to his bid to raise taxes on the wealthiest Americans and big corporations. The choice is about who the economy serves. And we can take this money, this money, and pay for universal pre-K for every three and four year old in America. His new $1.8 trillion plan expands government programs to pay for child care, paid family leave, unemployment reform, universal pre-K, and two years of free community college. But this plan isn't going to easily become reality. GOP lawmakers are pushing back strongly. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell confirmed Monday there won't be any Republican support for Biden's infrastructure package or his new American Families plan. Even some Democrats have expressed concern over yet another more than trillion dollar package from the Biden administration. One moderate Democrat warns that if they aren't careful, massive spending plans like these could flood the market and cause inflation. But we can't over overreach to the point to where we stormy investments we stormy basically growth for 2022 23 24 and on biden's family's plan makes the third massive spending plan in one month melina weiskup in td news florida's governor ron DeSantis just signed a bill banning vaccine passports he also announced that starting july 1st all local pandemic emergency orders will be stopped But to bridge the gap until July, he signed an executive order to suspend all local emergency orders and emergency penalties on individual businesses. This only affects governments, not businesses. DeSantis said this is an evidence-based thing to do and says proponents of lockdowns don't believe in vaccines, data or science. He said people have a right to participate in society without sharing if they're vaccinated or not. The law imposes a $5,000 fine for those who violate the vaccine passport ban. And a Democrat senator is calling on the Biden administration to assess the crisis on the southern border. NTD's Steve Lance has more on that from Washington. President Biden has been in office for about three months. Since taking office, he has signed 94 executive orders related to immigration policies, many of which rolled back Trump-era policies, which experts say had stabilized the border. The fact is that if you either detain individuals or alternatively send them back across the border, which the Immigration and Nationality Act allows uh, to await their hearings, it's a lot better way to make sure that good asylum cases get heard uh, more quickly. Over the weekend, Democratic Senator Maisie Hirono appeared on PBS where she referred to the border issue as a crisis and said she hopes Vice President Harris will visit the border. I think the the president calls it a crisis. I I would call it a crisis. We can call it a challenge, but we know what the factors are. We know what what is happening. So whatever you call it, Mm -hmm. we're going to need to deal with it. We're going to need to address it in a humane way. I'm not going to point fingers at her in the sense of uh, uh, I hope that she will go down to the border. I hope that we can have a comprehensive whole of government approach. Andrew Arthur, a fellow at the Center for Immigration Studies, says it's not as simple as just making the trip down to the border. I believe that the optics would be very bad for the Biden administration if the vice president were to go down there. Needless to say, there would be a lot of press attention paid to that, which would give the Biden administration two choices, either allow the press to go along 
and see large numbers of migrants who are being apprehended, large numbers of migrants who are being released, or alternatively have a press blackout, which would lead to people uh, alleging that the Biden administration was hiding something. In March, Biden asked Harris to manage the migrant surge at the border. There has been some confusion as to what her role actually is. Initially, it was thought that she would be involved with policy on border issues, but she has since distanced herself from that role, stating that Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas will be handling the logistics on the border, and she will be playing more of a diplomatic role with Mexico and other Central American countries. Steve Lance, NTD News. And today, Biden raised the cap on refugees entering the country. Immigration activists say it's long overdue. The cap was previously set at 15,000 per year by the Trump administration. Today's rollback will allow over 62,000. And Biden says he plans to increase the cap to 125,000 refugees by 2022. And at least four people are dead and more than two dozen hospitalized after an overcrowded boat capsized and broke apart just off the San Diego coast on Sunday. Authorities suspect it's a human smuggling operation and the captain of the boat is now in custody. At least three people died and 27 more were injured after a suspected smuggling boat capsized off of Point Loma in San Diego on Sunday. 30 people total. Uh, there were three deceased people in the whole entire mix of that uh, incident. And in my 28 years of working, never seen anything like this or been on a call of this uh, magnitude. Every indication from our perspective is that this was a smuggling vessel we used to smuggle migrants into the United States legally. Uh, we haven't confirmed the nationality of the, the people involved. So about 9.56 a.m. this morning, we had a call on VHF uh, Marine Radio of a vessel possibly in distress off of the tip of Point Loma. Officials said the group was overcrowded on a 40-foot cabin cruiser that's larger than the typical open-top wooden boats, often used by smugglers to bring people illegally into the U.S. from Mexico. So that's what happened. He got blown in, hit by waves, broadsided, landed on the reef. People were slowly jumping off the vessel and then just basically broke apart from its own weight and from the waves. This was a mass rescue operation that turned into a mass casualty incident. We had about 30 rescues um, when the boat vessel broke up on the reef. The boat captain has been taken into custody and will likely face criminal charges. Border Patrol says in a press release that they have seen a dramatic increase in the number of maritime smuggling attempts recently. On Thursday, border officials intercepted a panga-type vessel traveling 11 miles off the coast of Point Loma with 21 people on board, 15 men and 6 women. Agents determined all were Mexican citizens with no legal status to enter the U.S. Border Patrol on Friday said law enforcement officials would ramp up operations to disrupt smuggling off the coast of San Diego and warn potential border crossers of the dangers of trying to illegally enter the U.S. at sea. The battle against human trafficking never ends. And in the U.S., the issue is exacerbated by the surge at the border. That's according to a panel of experts in Texas. NTD's Don Tran has the details. In the U.S., human trafficking is common in all kinds of communities, including suburbs. Texas is one of the states leading the country in human trafficking cases. Experts on this issue formed a panel in Dallas to talk about their efforts in fighting back. we got to eradicate and eliminate this thing, and the only way you do it is you step up to evil and you fight it. This is fire meets fire. This is taking, this is taking communities back. Human trafficking is the act of forcing or coercing someone into engaging in forced labor or sexual activity. Children are considered victims of human trafficking, regardless of whether they were forced to or not. One of the panelists said human trafficking awareness was non-existent in the past. When I got involved in the political end of things, I went to a, a convention. And I remember looking at the platform and there was nothing in there about trafficking and I was doing research online, and this was probably 12, 13 years ago, and you couldn't find anything about it. Illegal immigration, which is heavily connected to human trafficking, was also discussed. Former ICE Special Agent Victor Avila said incoming migrants could be involved in human trafficking and human smuggling. He also said what's happening at the border is going beyond a crisis. After coming into office, President Biden took down Operation Talon, which had the job of tracking down fugitives. Operation Talon focused on sex offenders, illegal aliens convicted of sex crimes, serious sex crimes, and President Biden shut it down. 
Experts on the panel said the best thing ordinary citizens can do is to reach out to their lawmakers to increase support for anti-human trafficking organizations and to strengthen laws against human traffickers. Don Tran, NTD News. Bill Gates is getting a divorce. He will split with his wife Melinda Gates after a 27-year marriage. The billionaire and former Microsoft CEO announced the decision on Twitter today. The statement says, after a great deal of thought and a lot of work in our relationship, we have made the decision to end our marriage. It goes on to say that we no longer believe we can grow together as a couple in this next phase of our lives. And we ask for space and privacy for our family as we begin to navigate this new life. The two of them started the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2000 and have three children. According to Forbes ranking, Bill Gates is currently the world's fourth richest person. And what if the government could track your online movement without a warrant? The Biden administration might be partnering with an outside firm to monitor private citizens. NTD's Christina Kim speaks to a cybersecurity expert on this topic. The Biden administration is reportedly considering partnering with private firms to track Americans' online activity. CNN reports the Department of Homeland Security is discussing the plan to monitor extremist chatter and narratives that could lead to something potentially dangerous. Normally, Homeland Security can't monitor citizens without justification or a warrant, but by partnering with private firms, they would be able to go around these limitations. Cybersecurity expert Gary Milievsky is a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security and CEO of Cyber Defense Media Group. He comments on the move. Well, I think this is totally unethical and, you know, it violates the Constitution. Milievsky says the easiest way for the Biden administration to get data on U.S. citizens without asking the National Security Agency to break the law is to buy it from private organizations like social media companies. And by using private companies, they can shift the blame to them if things go wrong. If you use corporatism to spy on people, you can say, hey, it's private company. It's you've agreed to their terms. It's a slippery slope to the doom of the privacy and the sovereign citizenry of the greatest nation on earth. He says these cases should be taken up by the courts, but that the Supreme Court hasn't been operating fairly in their willingness to take on cases that are of incredible significance to this country. If the courts don't say this type of behavior is wrong, that could be dangerous, he says. We are entering the Orwellian 1984 nightmare, and in fact, America will be spying on citizenry equally to China, which is unheard of, because that's a communist thing to do. That's not a capitalist, free society thing to do. Milievsky says the idea of trying to comb through extremist chatter is a standard that's already been weaponized. The folks who like Trump are now called domestic terrorists. Uh, People who just read things online that they're not supposed to read, like QAnon, are now domestic terror threats. You can't have free will in America anymore to make your own mind up, to make your own decision on what's real and what isn't. He says freedom and privacy are invaluable and that Americans are already beginning to stand up to safeguard it. Christina Kim, NTD News. 39 Republican lawmakers are urging the Secretary of Education to remove the 1619 project from federal grant programs. They say schools should not be encouraged to teach the divisive content because Americans never voted to teach their kids that America is inherently evil. The 1619 project was spearheaded by the New York Times. It attempts to cast the Atlantic slave trade as the dominant factor in the founding of America. The project also tries to mark the year 1619 as the nation's foundational date, the year that the first enslaved Africans arrived in America. That's in contrast to the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Some have criticized the project as a bid to rewrite American history through a left-wing perspective. Earlier this month, the Department of Education labeled the 1619 Project and Critical Race Theory as leading examples to receive a $5.3 million grant for American history and civics education. But 39 Republican lawmakers are not happy about this, calling it a move to politicize education and propel left-wing propaganda. Instead, they want the federal grants to prioritize American history programs that will empower future citizens to continue making our nation the greatest force for good in human history. 
The results are in from a special election in Texas, leaving two Republicans to advance to a runoff election for a seat in the House. NTD's Jason Perry tells us more. 23 total candidates entered the race for Texas's 6th congressional district. The seat became vacant after Representative Ron Wright died of the CCP, or Chinese Communist Party virus, in February. Ron Wright was the first sitting member of Congress to die of the virus. His wife, Susan Wright, also entered the race to fill his seat. Her campaign mostly focused on her husband's legacy. But just days before the special election, she was endorsed by former President Trump. Trump said Susan Wright will be strong on the border, crime, pro-life, our brave military and vets, and will always protect your Second Amendment. Wright became the top vote-getter in the special election. Since she didn't get over 50 percent of the vote, Texas will hold a final runoff election between the two top vote-getters. Republicans Susan Wright and Jake Elzey will face off in the runoff election. That's after Elzey narrowly beat Democratic candidate Jana Lynn Sanchez over the weekend. Sanchez conceded on Sunday and said, Democrats have come a long way toward competing in Texas, but we still have a long way to go. Democrats currently have a six-seat majority in Congress. A date has not yet been scheduled for the runoff election. Jason Perry, NCD News, New York. Social media platforms have recently been on the spotlight. That's because of what many have called widespread censoring of certain people and groups using the sites. Some say the standards they use to regulate content have become arbitrary. Former President Donald Trump is expected to hear his future status in regard to the social media platform Facebook this Wednesday. Trump has not been able to make a post in over three months after being censored by Twitter and Facebook. Facebook has tasked an advisory board with the decision that is expected to be made known on Wednesday at 9 a.m. The Facebook-appointed board consists of lawyers, scholars, and other outside experts. The board was expected to make a ruling much sooner than the 90-day review period, but because of an overwhelming amount of public feedback, it took longer than expected. The former president has been relatively quiet over the past three months, relying on occasional interviews and public statements to get his message out. Trump has also mentioned the possibility that he would launch a social media platform of his own in the coming days. And India has reported over 300,000 new virus cases every day for over a week. Now one more Indian state says it will start a two-week lockdown this Wednesday. NTD's Miguel Moreno has that story. India reported its highest number of COVID-19 cases in a day over the weekend, some 400,000 on Friday. The bulk of these numbers are coming from India's western and southern states. Kerala and Maharashtra are among them and their governments have issued lockdowns. Then there's Odisha, one of the latest states to issue a lockdown, even though their case numbers are far lower than the other two mentioned. At least 10 states out of 28 have issued some kind of a lockdown. As states continue to go in lockdowns, uh, counties and districts and different types of municipalities are going into lockdown on their own. Professor Jagdish Gupchandani says Odisha is preparing for a potential storm. So how significant is it that Odisha has now locked down? Um, It is significant. I think even if they don't have a problem right now, they're anticipating a problem because it started, uh, the surge started in western part of India and then it moved to the north and now it will move to the northeast, which is Odisha. So I think many states are now just going into lockdown in anticipation that they will not be able to deal with the surge. But he says it'll come at a cost. The unfortunate part is that Odisha is not the richest state in India. And so there will be a lot of devastation with the economy and people and the workforce. And a lot of people are migrants. Um, so it remains to be seen how they'll deal with the other side of the pandemic. Uh, beyond the infection, how do they deal with providing food and security to people? The latest government data we could find from 2012 shows over 30 percent of Odisha's population living in poverty. According to Times of India, will qualify as essential and emergency businesses will be unaffected by lockdown measures and election-related work will be allowed. Prime Minister Modi is facing pressure to issue a countrywide lockdown, but he has opposed the idea, saying lockdowns should be last resort. India is undergoing an election, and Kupchandani says the surge is being politicized. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Coming up, more states are lifting virus restrictions. Governor Cuomo makes two major announcements for New Yorkers that may bring New York City nightlife back into full swing. 
And family members of deceased nursing home residents in New York are taking aim at Governor Cuomo. They're calling for an investigation into his alleged cover-up, claiming he deflated the number of deaths for personal gain. All that and more on NTD News. As pandemic restrictions ease up in New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo makes two major announcements to get the state closer to fully reopening. NTD's Jason Perry has the details. Governor Andrew Cuomo says most capacity restrictions on businesses in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut will be lifted on May 19th. This includes most businesses like retail, food services, hair salons, and barbershops in the tri-state area. Customers will still need to maintain six feet of social distancing if no barriers are in place. Cuomo explains why he needed to coordinate the reopening with the bordering states. If we say the restaurants are open in Connecticut, but not in New York, you'll have New Yorkers driving to Connecticut. You'll have New Yorkers driving to New Jersey. Uh, the coordination is important because you're a mobile population. Governor Cuomo also announced the transit system will return to 24-hour operations on May 17th. That's the same night the midnight curfew on bars and restaurants is going to lift. Since the pandemic started, New York City Transit has been closing overnight for cleaning and disinfecting. And homeless people who were sleeping in the subway systems were referred to supportive services. 24-hour service, yes, but the trains must remain clean and we have to help the homeless and we can't go backwards on the quality of service. The MTA plans to continue its cleaning and disinfecting service as it moves to 24 hours. Currently, over 75% of MTA customers feel that the subway has never been cleaner. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. A New York lawmaker and residents gathered in Manhattan today. They're calling for an investigation into Governor Cuomo's alleged cover-up of nursing home deaths in the state. NTD's Kevin Hogan has more from families who lost loved ones. I rushed him to the emergency room that night. Joanne Rodriguez's father was living in a New York nursing home in Westchester County when she got a letter on March 13th last year from the home. It said there would be a lockdown due to the virus. The home said she could contact him via FaceTime, but to no avail, which started to make Rodriguez nervous. About two weeks later, Governor Andrew Cuomo issued his infamous executive order. When Rodriguez heard the news, her panic worsened. Finally, about four weeks later, she heard back from the nursing home. They told Rodriguez her father had COVID and they rushed him to the ER. She had to make the tough decision whether to put him on a ventilator or let him go naturally. Before I was even able to make that decision, I got a call back from the ER doctor about five minutes later telling me my father took his last breaths. So, my thing is this, it's now a year later, we still don't have answers to why Governor Cuomo had made that executive decision to allow COVID positive patients into our nursing home facilities where our vulnerable population live. Grace Colucci's father was in a New York nursing home for rehab last March. She says he contracted COVID when he was there. When he came out, they didn't even tell us that he was sick. He, we had to carry him out, but he's not counted in the numbers because he didn't die in the nursing home. He's part of the 15,000 that Governor Cuomo lied about. On March 25th, Governor Cuomo issued an executive order saying nursing homes could not turn away any COVID-positive residents returning from hospitals. New York State Representative Ron Kim joined Voices for Seniors on Monday. They called on Attorney General Letitia James to investigate Governor Cuomo's administration for allegedly covering up nursing home deaths due to the CCP virus. Kim alleges Cuomo told his allies to deflate nursing home information for personal gain. We know, we now know why, because he was chasing a four to $5 million book deal, and he was also protecting the corporate interest groups, such as the nursing home executives who got a sweetheart uh, get out of jail free card deal out of Governor Cuomo. Cuomo's office did not respond to a request for comment by airtime. State Attorney General Letitia James is reportedly investigating Cuomo for alleged sexual misconduct as lawmakers call on her to investigate Cuomo's alleged cover up of nursing home deaths in his state. And the federal investigation into this continues. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. 
Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser kicks off a plan Monday to reduce crimes in summer. The district's police department identified six high crime areas this year. Last year, uh, for example, uh, the summer crime initiative was very effective in reducing theft in those areas by 46 percent, reducing burglaries by 29 percent, uh, and producing an overall decrease in violent crime by 10 percent. Mayor Bowser's announcement comes after a violent weekend in the district. This year, there have been 66 homicides so far, increasing 38 percent from 2020. Last year this time, there were 47 homicides, but this year, the number of violent crimes slightly went down at 1,090 compared to 1,100 in 2020. During the last 11 years, D.C.'s police department has utilized all available resources to reduce crimes in its targeted areas. The D.C. Police Department told NTD seven people were shot and one man was stabbed on Sunday. Philadelphia's newest museum offers a message of hope and unity. Its exhibits show how ideals of faith and the Bible influenced key American figures. NTD's Sapphire Quarter brings us the details. The Faith and Liberty Discovery Center opened its doors to visitors over the weekend. It is owned by the American Bible Society. The museum tells the story of the Bible's influence on America's most prominent figures and its foundational principles. Alan Crippen, the center's chief of exhibits, says he hopes to show an aspect of America's history he thinks has been missing. It's the narrative of faith. What is the relationship of faith to liberty? It is uh, our view that faith guides liberty toward justice. The museum is divided into six sections, faith, liberty, justice, hope, unity, and love. These are the values that have always been there. These are the values that bring out the best in what it means to be an American. While its ideas may be old, its interactive experience might be one of the newest in the world. The walls are covered in screens telling America's history. A semicircular room tells the story of William Penn's founding Philadelphia. And you then find yourself imprisoned in the Tower of London. When you see an exhibit you like, you can mark it with your lamp. At the end of the trip, this hall recreates the memories of your favorite parts of the museum. It took six years to make. Crippen says he thinks there's something to the museum's opening at a time when America is so divided. We need to find what, what it is that, that unites us and, and not, not divides us. There is so much greatness. Um, in, in our story. He hopes the center can help people look back as they wrestle with moving forward. Sapphire Quarter, NTD News. Coming up, Massachusetts lifted its mask restrictions on outdoor gatherings. The day after, thousands of people rallied in Boston for truth, freedom and health and for less restrictions. And tens of thousands of California inmates may be eligible for early release thanks to a new law. Citizens worry about increased crime and theft as lenient laws encourage repeat felons. That and more on NTD News. There's cultures that have been lost, but this culture hasn't been. The artist is showing us our sense of who we are, where we came from. You look at his hat. His hat is knitted probably by a man because a man traditionally knitted the hats. That hat tells you the story of who this person is, what his place in the culture is, the animals around him. Everything's all contained in the messages in the hat. And the tool that he's carrying over his shoulder. This is a centuries old tool that has been able to rework the mountains. Those traditions are invaluable, and if we don't honor those traditions, then we're rootless. The artist is showing us the value of 
maintaining our culture and respecting our culture. Rally goers were rooting for truth, of freedom and health on Saturday. They protested against state mandates and for the working class of America. The organizer referred to it as a bottom-up movement. Truth, freedom and health. Truth, freedom and health. May 1st is the second day after Massachusetts lifted its outdoor mask mandate. Demonstrators demanded the state lift all mask mandates and other restrictions. The rally was organized by Dr. Shiva Aya Duray, who studied biological engineering at MIT and is running for U.S. Senate. Speakers shared their experiences with mask and vaccine mandates. I have a granddaughter who will be turning a year old in July. I had to wear a mask around her. That was the only way I could see her. She refused to come to me. It tore me apart. She cried. She didn't respond to my soft voice. Aya Dure encouraged people to take action in order to make changes happen and not to rely on any political party or government officials. He used the example of the eight-hour workday movement in the late 1800s and early 1900s. If we can't do that, we can't get to the truth. And without the truth, we don't have our health. Without your health, you are restricted with your freedom, so it's a vicious cycle. The organizer also said less pharmaceutical drugs are produced each year, whereas the vaccine market is growing. Pharmaceutical drugs ain't doing too well, guys. They need vaccines. Vaccines are their trillion dollar opportunity. Over a thousand people attended the rally in front of the Massachusetts State House in Boston. Yeah, hey, it's my body, my choice. Don't tell me I have to wear a mask. Don't tell me I need a passport. You guys get all vaccinated and all masked up. What do you have to worry about? Step away. Aya Dure told supporters that education is vital. He hopes the rally's momentum will continue and that the working class will come together. California is allowing tens of thousands of inmates to be released early. Many are violent repeat felons. This and the lenient laws on theft are worrying citizens. NTD's Eileen Ang has more. California is giving 76,000 inmates an opportunity to leave prison early as the state aims to reduce prison population. Over 63,000 prisoners convicted of violent crimes will be eligible to shorten their sentences if they show good behavior, of which 20,000 are serving life sentences with possibility of parole. The State Office of Administrative Law approved the changes on Saturday. Californians have been increasingly concerned about laws becoming more lenient toward criminals. Senate Bill 82, introduced by Senator Nancy Skinner, would redefine the crime of petty theft. So this is going to give the option that if the item that's being stolen that's less than a certain amount of money, even though it's by force or fear that it's no longer a robbery and or no longer um, stands for the punishment of or the correction of a robbery. So that is not okay because it's going to empower many individuals to commit robbery. According to the bill, if the robbery is under $950, no gun is used and the victim is not seriously injured, it would be considered a petty theft instead of a felony. This is not accessible. We, especially our elderly, need to feel safe. Any robbery is a felony. And if a robbery involves the use of weapon or serious injury, then it would go a higher level, aggravate a felony. So Skinner is going the opposite direction. Therefore, everybody is frustrated. When they reached out to Skinner's office, he said she offered amendments to the bill. So the essence of the bill, you know, if not changed, amendments, um, you know, basically uh, do not mean much. Opponents are asking Skinner to withdraw SB 82 altogether. The bill is currently on hold. Eileen Ng, NTD News, California. The Environmental Protection Agency today proposed a rule curbing the use of a chemical gas. 
It's the dominant refrigerant currently used in U.S. air conditioners. So what does this mean for cooling your house in the summer? NTD's Lynn Lin reports. The new rule would cut production and importation of hydrofluorocarbons in the U.S. by 85 percent over the next 15 years. This is the Biden administration's first major step to reduce planet warming emissions. Hydrofluorocarbons, also known as HFCs, can stay in the atmosphere for 250 years. Scientists say they are more powerful than carbon dioxide at warming the Earth. Currently, HFCs are widely used in air conditioners and refrigerators. This new regulation is set to take effect in 2022. We don't anticipate any, you know, increase in prices uh, for equipment uh, when the new refrigerants are being used. If it is, it will be a minimal. Consumers don't have to do anything with the equipment they have now. If your air conditioner needs repair, Dietz says the standard refrigerants will still be available. You will not have to replace your system prematurely. Only if your system like fails and needs to be replaced will it have to be replaced with the new uh, equipment using the new refrigerants. But so don't let anyone tell you that you know you have to replace your system because there are new refrigerants because that is not true. And I want to make sure people understand that. The EPA's proposal also includes some potential exemptions, such as military applications. The agency plans to finalize the rule later this year. Lin Lin, NTD News. Coming up, a record number of Chinese tourists are packing attractions across China. That's despite the country just reporting a new variant of the CCP virus. And a Chinese rocket weighing about 21 tons is expected to fall back to Earth in the upcoming days. Debris from the rocket could crash down at random locations. That and more on NTD News. Domestic tourists are flooding attractions across China. That's despite authorities just detecting a new variant of the CCP virus. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more. First, we turn to China's Labor Day holiday travel peak. Tourist attractions in China are seeing a record number of visitors right now. Videos circulating online show tourists packing attractions across the country, like the Great Wall and the Forbidden Kingdom in the north, and the West Lake in the city of Shanghai along the coast. Authorities say travelers are expected to make over 200 million trips domestically. That's an uptick compared to two years ago. The travel peak comes as Chinese authorities are discovering the new Indian variant of the CCP virus in a number of cities. India first detected this variant, and the country is now struggling with a surge in virus cases. India's health system is now overloaded, and some patients died before they get to see a doctor. Although it is unclear if the new variant is what drove the spike in India, a top Chinese health official is warning the public not to let down their guard. Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping has a plan to censor the Internet on a global scale. That's per leaked documents obtained by the Epoch Times. China is home to the world's most far-reaching online censorship and surveillance system. And Beijing seems to want to expand it worldwide. The ambition seems to date back as early as 2016. In a speech to China's top Internet authorities, Xi said that controlling the Internet had become the focus of China's national strategy. The end game is for Beijing to control all content on the global Internet. His strategy starts with placing Chinese agents in important positions inside global Internet organizations. Then Xi aims to eventually gain control over the Internet's base infrastructure, including root servers. Domain Name System, or DNS, root servers are crucial to digital communications around the world. If the Chinese regime were to gain control over enough of them, Beijing would gain the power to censor anything. For example, if a user tried to access a news article about a topic deemed sensitive by Beijing, the regime server could reroute the user to a fake page, saying the article is no longer available. In its annual report, U.S.-based nonprofit Freedom House labeled China as the world's worst abuser of online freedom. China has held a title for the past six years straight. Heads up. Debris from a Chinese rocket will be falling to Earth in the next few days. It could land anywhere because Beijing launched the rocket into space without a re-entry plan. NTD's Don Ma has more. 
Within the next few days, a Chinese rocket orbiting Earth will fall back to the ground. The rocket may or may not burn up completely while re-entering the atmosphere, and debris could crash to Earth at random. The Chinese rocket weighs a massive 21 tons. Unneeded spacecraft parts usually take a dunk into the ocean in pre-planned locations as they return to Earth. But this one is out of control, and parts of it could potentially land on populated areas. The uncontrolled re-entry will be one of the biggest ever. Last week, China launched its first piece of its permanent space station into orbit. It was carried there by a Chinese rocket called the Long March 5B. The rocket successfully sent the space station piece into orbital velocity. Orbital velocity is the speed where an object needs to move to stay in orbit, and how fast it needs to move to be able to resist Earth's gravitational pull. When objects reach orbital velocity, they don't fall back to Earth. But the Long March rocket itself did not reach orbital velocity, and is now being pulled back to Earth. Payload rockets like the Long March often don't reach orbital velocity. Usually, built-in systems enable a controlled re-entry in a designated and safe location. But Beijing scientists didn't equip the Long March with a re-entry system. As a result, it will randomly fall back to the planet. U.S. military radars put its current movement speed at around 16,000 miles per hour. Based on its trajectory, U.S.-based news outlet Space News roughly estimates its point of re-entry could reach as far north as New York, Madrid, and Beijing, or as far south as Chile and New Zealand. This isn't the first time Beijing has opted for an uncontrolled landing. Its previous Long March rocket also came back via the same method in 2020. Debris from it reportedly hit villages in Africa, accompanied by sonic booms and bright flashes. That's according to local media. No injuries were reported. Jonathan McDowell is an astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He told Space News that by current standards, it's unacceptable to let it re-enter uncontrolled. He added that since 1990, nothing over 10 tons has been deliberately left in orbit to re-enter uncontrolled. Beijing's recent rocket launch is not its last either. China plans to send up 10 more rockets before the end of 2022. Don Ma, NTD News. The Paycheck Protection Program was designed to help American small businesses dealing with the pandemic. But hundreds of millions of dollars from these funds found their way to companies tied to the Chinese Communist Party, according to a report. The U.S. Small Business Administration and Treasury Department have awarded at least $192 million, but as much as $419 million, to businesses linked to the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, through the Paycheck Protection Program, according to new media outlet Just the News. The loan program's funds come from COVID-19 stimulus packages. It's designed to provide a direct incentive for U.S. small businesses to keep their workers on payroll. Not all American small businesses harmed by the COVID-19 crisis were able to take advantage of this program, but data from strategic consultancy firm Horizon Advisory last year shows at least 125 CCP-connected companies were able to benefit directly from U.S. investment and relief measures. It also shows that at least 32 firms received over $1 million in loans for a total of $85 to $180 million. These firms range from the state-owned Chinese defense conglomerates to U.S.-based semiconductor companies owned by Chinese state-controlled capital vehicles to Chinese-owned media outlets. The report claims Congress has not conducted any meaningful oversight over China's access to PPP loans so far. It has not restricted access to companies with military ties to Beijing either. Horizon Advisory concludes that the CCP treats COVID-19 recovery as an opportunity to accelerate a global strategy intended to undermine U.S. economic prosperity, national security, and information freedom. Coming up, foreign ministers from the G7 nations meet in London in their first face-to-face discussions in two years. Russia and China are big on the agenda. And the finger of an enormous statue is united with other fragments of its body after 550 years apart. The artwork depicts a Roman emperor, and the missing piece is shipped to a museum in Rome. Stay tuned to find out more. Hi folks, Joe Namath here, and if you're on Medicare, this is important. 
you're now entitled to eliminate co-pays and get dental care, dentures, eyeglasses, prescription coverage, in-home aids, unlimited transportation, and home-delivered meals, all at no additional cost. Plus, your zip code may have coverage with the give back benefit that adds money back to your Social Security check every month. I call to get dental, transportation, meals, and the give back benefit. With this virus situation, I call to get everything I'm entitled to. I couldn't believe I was missing out on so many benefits. With the uncertainty of the virus, you need to get everything you're entitled to. Millions of people have trusted the Medicare coverage helpline. You can too. Call now. It's free. Call 1-800-764-1930. That's 1-800-764-1930 now. Foreign ministers from the Group of Seven Nations are meeting in London in their first face-to-face -face discussions in two years. Russia and China are big on the agenda. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab sees a scope for even greater international cooperation as foreign ministers of the G7 countries gather in London on Monday. But what matters to us most is that we're broadening the caucus, the international caucus of like-minded countries that stand up for open societies, human rights and democracy, that stand up for open trade, um, that want to get to the bottom of how this pandemic uh, started. It's their first in-person meeting since the COVID-19 pandemic began. The UK holds the group's rotating presidency this year. Monday's meeting is kicking off a week of diplomacy aimed at reinvigorating G7's role. Among the topics are pandemic recovery, vaccine distribution, climate change, and how to deal with Russia and China. In all of these areas, we want to be absolutely firm and standing shoulder to shoulder, not just with Americans, as important as they are, but also with our wider allies. That's why the G7 is so important. Britain has identified Russia as the biggest threat to its security, though it views China as the greatest long-term challenge, militarily, economically and technologically. We want a constructive relationship with China, but on things, whether it's intellectual property theft or standing up for human rights in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, obviously we're going to be very clear on our values uh, on Russia as well. The G7 members are Britain, the United States, Canada, France, Germany, Italy and Japan. Their combined gross domestic product is about $40 trillion, a little less than half of the global economy. The UK has also invited ministers from Australia, India, South Africa and South Korea this week. The ministers will lay groundwork for the G7 summit in Cornwall next month. Many think of the UK's Royal Marines as heroes. But did you know some can actually fly like superheroes? New footage shows just that. How do you take control of an enemy ship at sea? Existing methods, such as using a helicopter, are slow and vulnerable. So the Royal Marines have been testing how to speed up such an operation with jet suits. A Marine wearing the suit can land on the ship and then hook a caving ladder to permit, permit assaulting personnel access. Developer Gravity Industries says the suit will bring about a revolution in tactical capability for many special forces. And this week marks the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death. Although he still divides opinion, to many he's remembered as a hero with a long-lasting legacy. NTD's France correspondent David Vives takes us to an exhibition that sheds light on his death in exile. As the 200th anniversary of Napoleon Bonaparte's death draws closer, an exhibition in Paris sheds light on the emperor's legacy. The Invalid's Domes, where Napoleon is buried, presents some art pieces about the emperor. Like this unique micro-mosaic, according to the curator, fewer than 10 people in the world master this craft nowadays. It looks like a painting, but it is a mosaic, composed of thousands of little enamels. It's a masterpiece that reflects the light, like a painting that captures the light. 200 years after his death, the memory of Napoleon's remains strong in France, but this was not always the case. After his death, it took time for Napoleon to be rehabilitated. The man who had a reputation of being an eater of men suddenly became a martyr, even like a saint. Following a series of successful conquests across Europe, the French emperor met disaster in 1812. He lost more than 400,000 men when he tried to invade Russia. Although the emperor won around 60 battles during his life, 
his victories forced European countries to band together to resist him. The decisive defeat eventually led him to abdicate. The British banished him to the remote island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic, where he died. He wrote his memoir on the island, part of his effort to save his legacy as a military genius and visionary leader. Napoleon wrote his memoirs, and that's how he was born as a legend. In 1840, Napoleon's remains were brought back here to the Invalid's Dome. Napoleon's remains were brought back to France to be buried as his last wish said. I want to repose in my land, France, near the French people who I loved so much. A last wish honored. Here, under a cathedral built by French King Louis XIV, the emperor now rests. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. For the past year, the pandemic has hit Italy hard. But with the country now opening up, a new exhibition celebrates one of Italy's best-loved literary figures. This year, Italy commemorates the 700th anniversary of one of the nation's literary greats, Dante Alighieri. The 13th century Italian writer and poet, famous for his divine comedy, wrote in a wide range of topics including important theoretical works, moral philosophy and political thought. In his works, he drew inspiration from ancient classics by writers such as Virgil and Cicero. We imagined that this exhibition would tell Dante's vision of art, 700 years of interpretation of the character of Dante and his work. The exhibition takes place in Forli, in northern Italy, the very place Dante was exiled to from Arezzo, 30 miles southeast of Florence in 1302. It is believed that Dante wrote most of his best works while he was in exile. The exhibition draws together around 300 artworks from world-class museum collections across the globe. The Uffizi Galleries alone has contributed some 50 works, including famous portraits of the poet and a set of drawings by Michelangelo. But this year we have all put our strengths together to organize an exhibition that none of us could have put together alone. Unprecedented in both scale and scope, it demonstrates Dante's influence on art from the 13th century right through to the 20th century. Included in the exhibition are first editions of the Divine Comedy, Dante's most famous work, along with 14th century illuminated manuscripts. Highlights including many different interpretations of Dante's hell, purgatory and paradise. The exhibition ends with images of heaven inspired by Dante's Canto 33 of Paradise. The exhibition runs until July the 11th, and is held at the San Domenico Museum. Visitors to the Colosseum in Rome will soon get to see the structure as it was in ancient times. Italy's culture ministry is adding a new floor to the arena. The floor was removed in the 19th century by architects to get a view of the passageways underneath. Doing so revealed a network of hatches, hoists, and machinery used to bring men and animals up to the floor of the nearly 2,000-year-old Colosseum. The $22 million sustainable construction project will largely restore the structure to its previous condition and allow those ancient machines to work again. Some of the slats of wood used in the new floor will rotate to allow light to pass to the underground portions. The new stage will be used to host cultural events. The project will also install a system to collect rainwater used to supply the bathrooms in the monument. The construction is scheduled to be completed in 2023. And a missing finger from a giant statue of a Roman emperor is once again united with the hand it came from. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story. The remains of a massive statue of the Roman Emperor Constantine are held at a museum in Rome. But the index finger on the giant bronze hand had been missing for hundreds of years. But now it's finally being returned to its rightful position. A big blue box marked fragile has arrived from the Louvre Museum. Rome's mayor thanked the Louvre for sending the finger and said the act showed collaboration and synergy. No one knows where the fragment was before it was discovered in Paris in 1860. Back then it came from the collection of a prominent Roman art collector. But it wasn't until May 2018 that they discovered it was part of Constantine's hand thanks to a 3D model brought to Rome from the Louvre. The fragment is gently lifted from the crate for the experts to examine. So we are going to effectively take a look at all the elements. It was well conserved on its journey. Pope Sixtus IV donated the bronze piece to the Roman people in the 15th century. 
The reunification of the finger and hand comes 550 years after they were separated. Only Constantine's enormous head and left hand remain, which is also missing other fragments. Visitors can see them in the Capitoline Museum. Erin Pastar, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.